sometimes a movie comes along and it just it kind of links up right at the right time with what's happening in your personal life. And I am getting ready after 15 years of being a, an English teacher. I am getting ready to leave the teaching world behind. Uh, no tears will be shed. And I will be, I will be going to work back in Cleveland. My wife and I are moving home and I'm going to go work for our sponsor, Odd Dog Coffee. I'm going to run his coffee truck Monday through Friday. Wow, that's amazing. amazing. So this has a real zeitgeist thing for you here, you know, the coffee it, thing. It does. It definitely does. And I've got my mom, just like Joe's mom, mom and dad actually being like, you sure about this? You sure you want to do that? Meet Joel Hansen. Good morning! This is her plant-based coffee shop. Coffee place and you don't serve regular milk milk. People like you demanding cow's milk. You're straight up cruelty to animals. Did you know that? Really having a good day. Did I mention that Joe is extremely broke? A female owner operator, <laughs> vegan barista, who is trying to change the world one cup of coffee at a time. She's extremely determined, passionate. She's got a vision and she just isn't going to let anything get in her way. Have some faith, I'll make you a believer. My name is Lee. This is Spro and Lee Take on the Academy. I'm joined today by Jody Savin, Randall Miller, and David Rollins, three of the biggest minds behind Coffee Wars. Jody and Randy, so happy to have you back. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. So, David, uh, me and my buddy started a podcast right at the beginning of, of the pandemic. Every episode, we look at an Oscar that we don't feel was given to the correct person. And then we take it away and give it to the person or the film that we thought deserved it more. I reached out to Jody because we wanted to break with the format a little bit and do an honorary Oscar. And we ended up doing an honorary Oscar on Alan Rickman. And Jody uh, was kind enough to come on and talk with Spro and I because she and Randy worked with him three times. We got some great stories out of him. After that conversation, they said, hey, we got another movie in the pipeline. And when it comes out, if you you want to hang out and talk about it we'd love to do that so here we are that is a very cool story <laughs> <laughs> a, little, a little long but uh no it's good yeah now alan rickman was uh i'd never met him but you know a good friend of randy jody's and um yeah he seemed like an um, amazing character and your podcast idea would have been a terrific thing to do during covid so yeah no that was brilliant well yeah it kept me from partially kept me from losing my mind <laughs> So since you are new on here, Mr. Rollins, how did you come to be the writer of Coffee Wars? I began life as a journalist and then an advertising you know, person. I got bored with that. I needed to write my tunnel out of that game. And uh, so I started writing novels. And one of them, you know, took Jody's interest. It was about a missing airliner in uh, during the Cold War. You know, we met over that. Yeah, become it's friends, you know, long distance book. friends. Yeah, it's a really great it's book. It's an amazing book. Well, that's very nice of you to say. Thank you. It's called it's called Zero Option. But um, yeah, so uh, look, you know, Randy and I and Jody, have, as I said, we've struck, struck up a, a long distance friendship and Randy and I sort of become daily, you know, Skype pals, you know, for years. And look, he had this idea about, we're working on a few things, you know, and he just had this idea about a crazy doing something about a coffee movie and um well, randy you, you might want to take oh, over we're, the story. we're also uh, dave and i are big coffee drinkers in general and uh australia if you don't know is another place uh that's they're very into coffee and so he and i would talk about that and then as uh, i always have done or and jody and i have done we're always thinking about ideas for other movies and the whole concept of coffee was an interesting arena to try to go into because just like bottle shock it has a whole collection of people that are really fond of coffee and how it's made <laughs> yeah, how it's produced it's and, everything else. and then we came across this notion of competitive coffee making which is the world barista championship which is sort of a amazing thing that happens every year you know where people from all over the world compete to become the best barista and that just seemed crazy and then we come to find out that they only allow cow's milk in the the competition so that when we heard that combined with the idea of competitive coffee making we thought okay there's our there's our conflict for the main character is the fact that she's a vegan barista and she's trying to compete in the world of coffee and she wants to do it without cow's milk and so that was sort of the the beginning of the idea in a way you know it's really timely actually 
When did you guys make this film? Because I, I was doing a little research and I saw an article where it was being discussed. Is it time to change that rule? Is it time to start allowing these non-dairy milks into competition? Well, I mean, it, you know, it takes a long time to make a movie. So we filmed the movie in 2019, 2020. And then with the pandemic and all that stuff, it took quite a while to finish. And then the distribution was always really, co it's complicated because you can't really do the festival thing. Like a lot of other movies we've gone to the festival like a year later. But during COVID, still. there was no festivals, at yeah. least not in person. So it was like this strange thing that happened where you're doing everything on Zoom and you're not meeting anybody. But in a interesting way it's i think it, you know you know strangely coming out of the back end of this pandemic it's actually freeing because you're not having to bow to the concept of getting into this festival or that festival you're going right to the marketplace um and people are watching movies at home instead of going to the movie theater so in a way for the independent world it's actually been a boon i think you know the whole concept of making your movie and then getting it out to everybody and not having to do the the normal you know run around to the festival and then go to a couple of art houses and then hope that you get to the next level. Now it's directly to home. But also, just in terms of the idea of the movie, when we started writing this thing in 2006, 17, 2018, no, I think, I think like it was that. like 18, 18, 19. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's 2018. Yeah. So in my country, in Australia, you know, uh, oat milk and and uh, almond milk and all these other, you know, sort of nut juices, if you like, <laughs> um, were, were just weird. You know, it was not a, it's a sort of a crazy thing that just fanatics did, you know. And, but in, in the inter, you know, in, in this period, in this COVID, period non cow's milk you know uh, sub or cow's milk substitutes have really soared you know it's become a like a massive thing in the zeitgeist yeah i mean you go to any coffee shop even this tiny coffee shop in the middle of nowhere in the outback they'll have oat milk they'll have macadamia milk they'll have you know all these crazy different milks you know so we were just lucked out you know in, in this sort of zeitgeist moment with this this whole alternative milk thing so I actually, I didn't tell Jody this when she, well, she didn't ask me flat out. Um, <laughs> she did say that she was vegan and that I do not. She said, I do not drink cow's milk. And I was like, shit, <laughs> because I, I do not take sugar in my coffee, but I do like cream. And I got to tell you, after I watched this movie, I was like, maybe it's time. And I, <laughs> next time I ordered a coffee, I ordered a, a tall half calf and I asked, what's your creamiest non-dairy? And they said, oat milk. And I said, okay, hook it up. And it was really good. I couldn't no, tell it, the it's, difference. Yeah, it's, it's really, really good. good. Yeah, it's really good. And it, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting because right when we were making the movie, there was a couple of articles in Bloomberg and different places about how Starbucks and some of the other big chains are trying to move towards, you know, non-dairy as a, as an option that maybe even in sometimes is the, you know, that's the go-to option. And then you can ask for a cream if you want, but they're trying to make it that that's the go-to option. And it came out of all of this press that, you know, it takes a thousand gallons of water to make one gallon of cow's milk. And the world that we live in with all the people that we have, it just can't sustain that much dairy, you know, like there's, oh, wow. there's cheese and everything else, but there's also the fact that, you know, apparently, I don't, I don't know the, I don't have the exact numbers, but apparently the milk that goes into Star Starbucks coffee around the world represents something like one or two percent of the dairy in the whole world. So if they were to change, that would that would be quite significant. So that's that's what's really interesting about this whole thing. It's like it's sort of almost on the edge of the you know yeah, the change. The new movement now, because a lot of coffee shops like upcharge you if you want a milk alternative, a dairy alternative. And so there's a whole movement now to say, you know, you shouldn't do that, you can't do that if you're really gonna support the health of the planet. It. All milk should be charged equally. We shouldn't get charged 70 cents more for oat milk. I think that there's like two different types of people. People who make fun of you for being vegan. Oh, they're vegan. Then there's also people who are like, that's really cool. I admire that. Wants me to go to college in the US. I don't know what she's freaking out about. I already crushed the SAT with double 800. I think it's really important that we use media to spread ideas that are going to affect environmental issues, political issues. I had a biology class. They taught us all about like the meat industry and how bad it was for the environment. Don't let them take it. <laughs> no, that's not gonna happen. They are very scary, no natural dudes like they literally have no discernible neck i think it's really important that if like we have the choice to do something that's good for the environment that we take that choice but i think there is a movement in the youth towards veganism which is awesome well, let me ask you this at odd dog coffee do you charge more for oh no i don't believe so okay good <laughs> i don't work there yet i don't work there yet <laughs>
I will make sure that that, that doesn't happen. <laughs> Michael and I will have a conversation. I mean, there's so many reasons uh, apart from environmental and ethical. I mean, I think the most convincing part, I'm a bigger fella. Um, I used to be muy guapo, as uh, Jim Gaffigan said. But <laughs> no more guapo. And I have, I'm on blood pressure medication. I think a lot of that has to do with the teaching, quite frankly. But that, for me, it's it's health. I think the be- the the most persuasive scene in the film is the, uh, is he Croatian? The judge is Croatian. Yes, but- yes. I love the judge. He's oh, such it's, a cool it's, character. It's, it's such a perfect peak. Like it's the conflict, 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 you know, story structure wise. There's the peak. What a great peak. And then the resolution of the of the competition. But that guy is great. And he he is, you know, most people are selfish. And most people in America have, uh, a lot of people in America uh, have health problems. And removing dairy is going to is going to be better in the long run like it was for that guy. Yeah. And it's just, it's an, it's a small change, but it could have, a you know, if you take it across the world, it could be significant, you know? Yeah, I started drinking oat milk in my coffee after doing this movie. And, you know, I did it because I thought, oh, you know, I really should try and make a kind of, you know, contribution, you know, like a real contribution other than, you know, writing the movie. And now, if you, look, there's no way I would I would go away from oat milk. It is just the coffee just tastes better. It's not, there's no sacrifice at all. And it lasts longer. Oat milk, uh, you don't have to worry about using it up quite as quickly. <laughs> and it's easier to milk those those stalks of oat, isn't it? You don't have to. Uh, that that never occurred to me. <laughs> never occurred to me, Randy. That's a very good point. <laughs> No, but the um, funny thing about it is, is that the reason why the sort of the crux of the movie that makes so much sense is that in the rule book for the World Barista Championship, Rule two point two point two, which is in the, <laughs> which is in the, it's in the rule book, they have to use cow's milk. And so when we heard that, we were like, okay, there's your middle of your second act, serious conflict that she has to deal with, you know. For a movie, it was really great, but also for the ethical thing, it ended up being really sort of brought the story together, which is really what's great about it. And then so when- are you saying that they've actually changed the rule? No, no, I no. They I haven't changed the rule yet. But I think they're oh, thinking they, about they're it. They're thinking about it. Yeah. They're certainly going to get a lot of heat after this movie comes out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then when we met Kate, the lead, she is a devout vegan. When I read the script, I was like, this is me. And also being vegan, born with a cause, you know. A late entry from the vegan side of the tracks. Struggling Josephine Hansen. Comedy, I think, is such a great way to bring people in. Meet Joel Hansen. Good morning! This is her plant-based coffee shop. It's a gift. I thought you might need it. You know how I feel about cow's milk. Becoming vegan completely changed my life. The idea of living as kindly as possible is really appealing to me. It's the drink that wins it all. Have some faith, I'll make you a believer. You know, she got the message. She got the character. She, you know, it's like, you know, it's also a women empowerment, women entrepreneurship message. Like, you know, she's very much this person in real life in many ways, but she believes in what she believes in and she she is committed to saving the planet and she's committed to saving the animals and she's committed to saving humanity. Um, yeah, when she came to our house, we were we were doing a, like a callback audition and, you know, because of COVID, we couldn't really meet people generally, but we wanted to meet her because she's in the whole movie and she came to our house and she said to us, this movie is me. Like, I am this character, you know, and we believed her because she really is committed, you know, and, and she was good, obviously really good, but... It's also the fact that it's nice when the, when the story really connects with the, the ethics of the lead actress because it's really easy for her to talk about it, promote it. Um, she believes in, in what the message of the movie is. It's fantastic. And she was really helpful, too, in that she hooked us up with all of these. We had all kinds of vegan wardrobe, vegan hair and makeup. You know, we had made sure that everything down the line and all that stuff, you don't think about it, but all that stuff was vegan as well, which was really important. You mentioned the lead, Kate Nash, who is one hell of a musician. Spro had heard of her. I had never heard of her. As soon as I watched the film, I jumped on YouTube and I looked up a bunch of her music. She's really good. Has a a large discography and many songs and dabbles in a lot of different styles. I really liked her her old kind of like folky stuff. I was listening to that. Yeah, she had a she had a um a sort of meteoric rise when she she was like a teenager. I don't know what the initial whether it was uh, an appearance on a TV show or something, but she had a song foundations and another song 
song, there was two or three songs that were number one hits in the UK when she was young. And then she went through a tumultuous representation where of, you always hear this in music where the record company steals from you, the manager steals from you. And she went through a horrible time. And then she had sort of a rebirth again in music. And it was about that time that she got this, uh, her first act, big acting role was in Glow. It was a Netflix series that really sort of reinvigorated her. And then we met her. It was the end of Glow. And that's when we met her. But but her music is really phenomenal. She still tours all over Europe. She has a new song out, which is getting a lot of play, called Waste Man. She's just really talented and really she's a star. She's well liked too in the in the she's music. She's a star. World. It's amazing. Her performance is so nuanced and so funny and so warm. Like she's amazing. She was giving me Kristen Wiig vibes. Another yeah. another very funny lady who has great comedic timing and delivery, but can do very nuanced performances. Um, and I'm glad that you brought that up. She is a woman's rights advocate. She has been a vegan since seeing Bong Joon-ho's Okja. Yeah, and exactly. I, I got to assume that those characteristics and credentials, you beat me to the punch. I mean, she is Joe. <laughs> I know. It's so funny when they when we realized that we were like, gosh, she's she's phenomenal. She's just so down to do anything. Like we went to, we shot in Columbia. She was with us doing all that. And she has a great spirit about her. She's fun. I can't say enough positive things about her. She's really, really phenomenal. And then this is the rest of the cast. How about Sorsha? Well, Sirsha, Sirsha is really great too. Sirsha, she plays her best friend. She's from Dairy Girls. She was the lead of Dairy Girls. And then when she auditioned for us, you know, she just, we were, we were originally going to cast, like we had, we didn't really know what, who we were going to cast in that role. And when she read, she just like sort of became that character. And we were like, oh, wow. Yeah, she owned it. Totally owned, owned it. Yeah, it was one of the best. It was taped because, yeah, because obviously she lives in, in another their country yeah. and taped auditions are tricky and it was like the most amazing audition like we saw that tape we were like there she is if i'm out and about i'll always get a coffee a local coffee shop can't start the day without a coffee <laughs> <laughs> from the very first read through we sat down and we read it all out loud it's an animal secretion just like cow's milk hold on a sec girlfriend Milk is an edible secretion, isn't it? Like, come. Every character is so well-rounded. It's great. But I would know this is poo, and poo is an edible. I think at the heart of the film, it's really about this character, Joe, trying to change the world one coffee cup at a time. A journey to save our magnificent and fragile planet. Such a strong ethos behind it. Such an interesting way to deliver that to the world. Comedy is a great way of reaching people. She did the scene. I remember she did the scene where um, there's a scene in the movie where Kate is sort of criticizing a drink that Sirius's character Rupa makes. And Rupa is so crushed by the idea that she's not worthy to be a full fledged barista. And she brought like this humor and heartbreak and kind of sort of kooky heartbreak. And we were like, oh, my gosh, this is so much more than what we wrote. It's so funny. Yeah. Really, she was phenomenal. I don't want to spoil the ending, but that moment where she kind of comes through in the clutch, I, I like got a little verklempt because they were like, <laughs> I did. That's funny. I did. You know, Randy, you just said about um, there was so much more than we wrote. I, I get that feeling right across the movie. You know, like we, we worked hard to make it as funny as we could, but the actors just brought so many dimensions to the, the characters in the story. It was quite a, you know, as my first movie, to, you know, um, was quite a uh, eye-opening experience just to watch all that happen and come to life. But, you know, Toby Sebastian, another fantastic yeah. actor. He, he plays uh, Rudy, the villain. I loved him from the start. I thought he was just fantastic. Says, is that a swan? I am the, I'm the villain, per se. Stop your idea with thumb milk. Wow, good memory. Well, I am a professional. He really enjoys winding her up and getting deep under her skin. And two-time United Kingdom Bristol champion. So England is hardly the United Kingdom. And you lost at Worlds. Well, there's always this year. I think a lot of the hardest things in the world, the biggest problems, are tackled sometimes best through comedy. And he's mostly known as a dramatic actor. I don't think he'd ever really done a comedic role. And when he auditioned, he completely invested in the character. So much so that when like he was playing the, I don't remember what scene he auditioned 
I think it was when he first meets Joe, and it was just the fact that he took it so very seriously and very and really passionate about his coffee. He was really phenomenal. I remember remembering the audition, but it was also just the fact that he had never done comedy before, and he felt like it was so freeing. Like he <laughs> wants to do more comedy now. Oh, he's, he's a natural. So he's funny. Amazing. He's so funny. He was my favorite. I mean, Joe, obviously, I like them all. And you you root for Joe. But every time he came on screen, I was like, nice. And especially, <laughs> especially the second time I watched him. I mean, you guys are you have such a, a tradition of, of just putting together really great casts. And I think this is the best. There isn't a, a single person in this film that feels like they gave it 60 percent. Everybody feels like <laughs> they're at 110. You almost feel like you have a ready made. I was saying this to you before we started recording. You almost feel like you have a ready-made single camera sitcom, you know, maybe just do a quick eight episodes of just the plantarium workers. I would devour that. Because, right. of course, you can always make eight episodes really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is it is true, though, that there's still conflict in the story that's like, obviously, you have this bad guy, Rudy, who's not going away. And you have all the various characters are all kind of slightly broken, which is what you kind of want in a sitcom or whatever you call it. A, it's sort of like The Office in that way. Like, they're all sort of slightly quirky and broken characters. Even Joe, she's not perfect by any stretch. But together, know. they make themselves unbroken. Right, right. Which is, you know, another underlying message of the movie, which is that, you know, as community, we are so much more effective than we are as individuals. And that's right. the only way we can really heal the planet. Exactly. And don't you like Rudy's haircut? I do. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could pull it off. I really like his his hipster over the top mustache. And he's not I mean, he's a bad guy, but as bad guys go, he's still likable. Oh, it's the smile. It's the smile that does it, you know. Yeah. It's yeah. still like this, you know, happy shark. <laughs> yeah. A funny thing about about Rudy's character too. So we David and I, when he came out here, we were working on the script and we went to meet Perry <laughs> at Clutch Coffee. It was like a That's right. Anyway, so there was a woman who ran that coffee place who was US champion and she number of years was US champion and she would go to various regionals win the regional and then go to another regional and try and win that regional because she was practicing right and so when we were thinking about Rudy's character we were like okay so he can lose but he can win somewhere else so that he can still get to the finals because that's what this woman did she basically would lose one place but then win the next regional she'd travel to Texas and do that one and then travel to the east coast and do that one and wherever she would win she could then go to the finals. So that's where that came up with that whole concept that uh, Rudy's character loses in the UK, but then he wins in Canada. And so he's able to still compete in the finals, you know? Yeah. I'm not giving, I'm not trying to spoil the movie for people, but I'm just saying. You just spoil it. Yeah, I did. I spoiled the movie. <laughs> it's such a, it's just a nice movie. It's like these movies like, okay, so like Pitch Perfect, or you were talking about Bridesmaids or Dodgeball. They're all a little bit broken in a way, like the characters aren't perfect. And they do have edge. They're not They're not like a Hallmark card or something. You try to make the journey as fun and kind of awkward as possible and keep cutting down the character so that they have to overcome more and more and more and more stuff. That's how I see it. 100% right. But, you know, like, this is what you do, Randy. You know, like, you're, you're right and create these characters and that's what you've done your whole career so it was great for me to to sit on your shoulder and and be part of that creative process and learn so much well i mean like going back to like alan rickman in the bottle shock he was sort of your reluctant hero too like he went all the way to to napa and he was trying to he was hoping just to get a bunch of crappy california wine and let the french win but then he couldn't do that because he also sort of thought that well geez this wine's good and so he was it's all this conflict going on internally in this character it was sort of like okay well what do we do with joe in this way well you know she has to battle her own demons which is whether she uses cow's milk or not cow's milk to try and win the competition because they're kicking her out of the competition if she doesn't do it the right way. I know what you mean, Lee, too, about it. it's a nice movie. It is a nice movie. It makes you feel good. You know, you watch this journey that these characters go through, this kind of crazy, extreme journey, and it makes you feel good. You don't feel it like you've just had a, a mouthful of saccharin or anything, you know, like it's you know, it's got a few little edgy moments in it too, you know, <laughs> fairly extreme, you know, 
conversations between characters. Yeah. So it's the sort of thing that you know, like can sit down with the whole family and mum and dad can squirm every now and then, but it's um it gives you all that sort of warmth, but a reward as well, you know, sort of a grown up reward. It's it's a lovely, you know, journey. It really is. Yeah, and then rounding out the ensemble is Owine Arthur, who oh is God. I oh, mean, why. that man is all heart. He and he's funny and kind. And he's he plays one of the lead roles of the Power of the Rings, the the new Amazon series. Which apparently he was yeah, on the ring. for the ring. while he was on set. Yeah, he was auditioning for it. He's he's so funny because he's like um he's Welsh. His accent's like pretty thick, you know? And um he just it's so funny to watch him be the guy who kind of tells tall tales and tells these kind of kooky stories throughout the movie, you know? He's got this genuine heart, but he's also kind of, I don't know, full of malarkey, full of shit or whatever way he tells these stories. We all know an Andy who is happily prodding along. He gets things slightly wrong. The half-naked samba dancers, which half of them is naked. Tom believes he is something that he's not quite. Oh, come on. Master Roaster here. I pride myself in the fact that I am good with animals. Paradoxus hermaphroditus, otherwise known as the Asian palm civet cat. I haven't worked with a civet cat before, nor have I worked with an iguana before. Yeah, the studded chihuahua collar was all that pet planet had. No polecats either. My girlfriend's got me babysitting a family of Welsh polecats. Not even a Welsh polecat. One attacked me. Hey. Ah! So that's why I'm late. <laughs> And he's just so, he's so invested. He's so great. And same thing with Jenny Ransford, who plays the banker. She's like just this incredibly funny, Tony. charming actress. Tony. Well, it's truly very pregnant. She was pregnant. <laughs> yeah, we weren't, we, right, David, we, she wasn't written as pregnant. But then when we saw her, she was pregnant. We were like, okay, you're pregnant. We added that. Yeah, we changed the lines just to, you know, <laughs> accentuate all that. Yeah. Yeah, no, she's great. Yeah, she's, she's great. And we just saw her and she's like, you know, to be able to act at that stage of pregnancy was such a gift, you know, that she just like went for it. She is a very funny actress. Really funny, mm -hmm. really charming. All the ensemble people too, like uh, Ray Fearon, Jordan, Ray Fearon who plays Bernie Dubuchet, Sally Phillips, who plays Lisa San Germain, and Freddie Fox, who plays like the German Hans Schlichenhaifen. Schlichenhaifen, love it. Yeah. And, uh, and Jordan, who plays her, her sort of love interest. Who's with, another UK musician. Yeah. Jordan Stevens. Yeah. I think Bernie. Ray Fear and I think got the biggest laugh from me <laughs> in the movie. Which one? Which one? When he finally says, Oh, give it up. You could be his his grandmother. She's sort of taken aback. She's like, Well, that was a bit uncalled for. Yeah. And he goes, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And even when he just goes, Okay, Lisa, like somehow he owns those yes, words. He owns and it. cracks me up every time. Yeah. yeah, he's really talented. He's a very serious actor. Like he's a he's a, a Royal Shakespeare actor. He was the youngest, I think he was the youngest Othello in the Royal Shakespeare Company to ever do it. You know, I mean he's a serious, serious actor. And then I saw him on uh he was in Fleabag. He was the lawyer who gave the lead woman like nine orgasms or something. And he he was just so funny in that he was he played it straight but very funny and then when i heard that he was interested i was like yes yes i love that i love that guy i love that guy <laughs> you know so well you guys have an absolute knack for putting people together and giving them the right roles i think the other part of it that makes it so endearing is i don't know who said it somebody i tried finding the quotes so that i could attribute it but there is this thought that filmmakers tend to make the same movie over and over again and in that i think what they mean is that there are there's threads that that you can see and i the big biggest one that I see pop, popping up in your films is these underdogs who want to do something new and fighting against this uphill battle to convince everyone, hey, this is this is not necessarily the way of the future, but look at this other way that things can be done. And Coffee Wars is yet again, another no exception. You, I mean, definitely in Bottle Shock and definitely in CBGB. And you can make an argument in Nobel Son. Well, but, maybe. But yeah, I think what, what draws you to the to telling these underdog stories? I grew up, okay, so I grew up in a family, you know, in Cali, I grew up in Pasadena in California. My parents were both doctors 
characters, but we always had like this almost commune living in our house. You know, my mother always had patients, indigent patients living with us. I had grandparents. I had, you know, at one point there were five exchange students living there. Like, and it wasn't a huge house. It was just like a house that always had lots of people living in it. And I always sort of, I didn't, I thought that's how everybody lived, you know? I don't know. I guess I'm always in a weird way kind of reliving the idea of being sort of the the underdog because I, I always gravitated towards those stories. Like, they always get me. Like, I'll get choked up when I read a story like on CNN about an underdog, you know? Like, I've always sort of, gravitated towards that you know in sports too i've always gravitated towards underdog stories you know like i'm always looking at the the team like like that princeton just lost but i was like rooting for them because they were the underdog in the ncaa tournament right so i'm always like thinking about that that's the thing that always struck me and i don't know i guess i i've always liked those movies and i've always you know it's wonderful life is one of my favorite movies so i like those kind of stories that say something about the human spirit about trying to overcome things i think everybody likes those kinds of stories because we've all been told at one point in time that our ideas aren't good and it's yes. nice. it's almost when when the characters are validated we feel validated as audience yeah i think so i mean my entree into filmmaking in general when it, i was at usc and i hadn't been selected twice for like the final thesis film and they took my script but they didn't select me the head of the directing program I went in to meet him and he said directors are born and you were not born a director and like the very next day I applied to a different film school to finish off at AFI because I was like okay that's not that's not where my head is going I'm thinking you can always sort of achieve something if you work hard enough you know so I've always been sort of trying to overcome something you must feel good that you proved him wrong huh well, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I proved him wrong. I just, I try, it was my, my goal was to try and say, well, he's not right about me or something. It's a life lesson. You can get things quick if you want, but if you're prepared to wait a little bit. Beans bring different altitudes and the taste preferences of the people consuming the coffee made by those beans. I imagine someone watching, it's a flat share, there's a few of them there, they maybe gone out the night before and they all watch it and then one of them's like, I like coffee. And then the other one goes, yeah, we know you like coffee. He's like, no, no, I really like coffee. And then in that moment, that person enters the European Barista Championship all because of a film that took a comedic look at it. That's the dream, bro. To inspire the next generation of barista. The look and feel of this film, too. I mean, again, you see the style. It's there from Nobel's son. But it. I think you, you're you just, you continue to really hone it. I mean, it's really vi quite a vibrant film. The color palette, the cinematography, the production design, and the pacing, the editing, it all crackles with like an energetic, almost like caffeinated vibe. It's quite something. Right. <laughs> um, shout out to Dan O'Brien, who uh, last worked with you guys for CBGB. Very good editor. I love the zing of, of your films. Yeah, I mean, it's a thing that I kind of, because I've watched all kinds of movies and stuff, but I'm always about, like, how can you tell the story from as many different angles as you can? Like, my mantra when I'm directing things is like, you don't have to get everything perfect in every single shot. But what you want to do is you want to make it as dynamic as you can and tell all the angles so that you can really construct something that has pace and has energy. And I always think this about in sports. It's like the team that has more energy tends to win. The one that sort of sits there and sort of sits on the shots and hangs and stuff. It tends to be more boring in my mind. Like I watch a movie and it just sits and hangs. It tends to be more boring to me. So I like things that you see all the angles. And it was really important that like the coffee was a whole element unto itself. Like it was a whole story unto itself. Like it had to be beautiful. Like the coffee had to be absolutely beautiful. So we had like a whole unit that was doing coffee shots. We talked about that right from yeah, the outset. Yeah. I mean, that's my background, the advertising coming. So we've got to make this food look luscious. You know, it's got to <laughs> really feel like a fabulous food ad, all it these works. coffee shots. Yeah, because I think that if you're going to take people on this journey and, and, and everything, they should see the coffee and think, wow, this coffee is amazing. Gosh, if it wasn't for the fact that she you know, makes it more difficult for herself that she's a vegan, she could probably win. But once you get over the, fa the fact that, OK, well, let's give her a shot, you know, that even though she's vegan and she doesn't do what they're supposed to do in the rule book, but her stuff is so great. It looks so great. It's so amazing. you know. So that it was part of that. It was part of that thinking. I think everybody who goes to a coffee shop think they are some kind of connoisseur of coffee. I love coffee. I have to have two in the morning. I have one just to kind of say hello to the day and then another one to kind of go, 
Right. Vegan coffee is winning in this little corner of the world. Our hero fighting against the milk drinkers. You know how I feel about cow's milk. You're kind of quoting a political message in comedy. It's cool to be vegan. Listener, when you do get around to watching Coffee Wars, which you absolutely should, this is not, at least this was not something I was privy to. I mean, these are like mixologists doing things that are, I mean, that you would see on like Chef's Table or on a, on a cooking show or episode where they deal with spirits and, and mixed drinks. It's really intricate. It's, it's art. <laughs> bizarre, of, actually. Right? It's bizarre. It is bizarre, but it's cool as hell. I mean, anytime somebody can be that passionate about something and it deals with creating, I'm on board. And just watching that, I would watch some actual documentary footage of these baristas making these drinks and putting these things into the... It's like, really? So every drink that's in the movie, every one of these complicated concoctions are real. Either they won or they were ones that had won before. You know, so just sort of to lay it out so that you understand. So that the idea, this happens every year, the World Barista Championships. And it is a, re- you know, regions that come together, countries come together, and they send their best to the to the finals. And it moves around like the Olympics from place to place all over the world. Right? <laughs> and the people win. They've won from Australia. They won from Korea. They won from they won from Poland. And the judges are also former competitors, and sometimes the you know the head of some brand or whatever, right? And the judges take it very seriously. There's an 825 point scale, and it's broken down into all kinds of different minutia. But basically, each competitor has 15 minutes to create three drinks for five judges. They have a whole music performance aspect. It happens in a stadium, like we do in our in our movie. It's it's kind of like a basketball stadium with like cameras up and down, and there's and there's announcers announcing just like we have. We go a little further, but they have to make an espresso. They have to make a crazy coffee mocktail drink, and then the third one is a cow's milk latte. They have to make those three drinks. However, they do them and they source their own beans. They source their own, like how they ever they do it. They source all that stuff. And then the judges, which we should talk about the judges, like in the judges in the movie, there's actually a, a judge in the movie played by Tobias Forrest, who's a phenomenal actor. He's a PWD, he's a disabled actor. In the movie, he plays a character that had a history with Joe and he uh, is sort of another nemesis for Joe. He represents the judges that you go up against who take it very seriously. It's like, I can only imagine what it would be like, uh, you know, to be the judge at like the Olympics or something, you know, it's like they take it very, very seriously. If you step over the line and long jump or if you hit the bar in the high jump, you know, they take it very seriously. Right. Well, it's the same thing in the coffee. They take it incredibly serious. And Tobias is just phenomenal in that role, you know, as the as the judge. But yeah, so all this is based in true things and the drinks are authentic. You know, we did a lot of research into the what the drinks were. I think most people probably don't know that these things exist. I mean, I guess they have, what do they have? They have the Air Guitar World Championships. So I mean, <laughs> they, might as, they might as well have baristas if they've got an Air Guitar World Championship. Well, the, they have video game championships. They, they have do. Go, there's a stadiums oh. where people watch people play video games. God bless me. I've never gone to one live, but I do occasionally like to watch that. <laughs> right. Also, it helps to be the, the world champion barista because... Yes. People do flock to your coffee shop from all over the place when they hear, you know, that this is the establishment of the champion barista. I would. Taken seriously. Yeah. I love coffee. I didn't really know about barista championships. I didn't actually know how serious they take it. Crumbled pecans. And over this knobbly ball, he pours single farm, fair trade Guatemalan coffee. And the first read through is just like boom, 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 boom. Point where when I went home, and I, how did it go? And I was like, it was fantastic, intimidating. It's a neat, like I, we talked about the pacing for a second. It's a real neat 104 minutes, which is nice. I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate that. I think um, I love long movies, but just the sake of like the new John Wick film was, I guess, originally supposed to be like four hours. It's like, oh my let's, gosh. let's back off a little bit. But in the 104 minutes, it, it is just, it never stops moving. The dialogue, the voiceover. We could talk about that. Plus Morgan Freeman. Yeah. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Do you remember, though, what the final page count ended up being? Spro one. Uh, I don't know. What was it, David? Do you remember? It was like 117 pages, maybe? It depends if you look at uh, if it's an American letter or Australian A4. It's kind yeah. of different. 
it was a hundred hundred pages in A4, and I think yeah, about one hundred and fifteen in in uh, American Letter. Spro and I, it's much easier to take Oscars away from movies and people. But when you start to get into like writing awards, we did a writing award. We took the best original screenplay away from John Patrick Shanley for Moonstruck, <laughs> <laughs> and we gave it to. We gave it to Oliver Stone's Wall Street. I thought it should have gone to James L. Brooks broadcast news personally. But yeah. the point is, we had to read the scripts. Spro is a screenwriter and he he insisted. He's like, if we're going to do this, we're going to do this right. And I'm going to send you these scripts and you're going to read them because he truly believes, as he's made me come to believe, that script writing is an art. When you are putting things on on a page, it's not simply to serve uh, a filmmaker. It's the prose should be there, but it shouldn't be too um, indulgent. You know, right. the, the dialogue should be there, but it should be purposeful at all moments. I mean, how do you feel when, when you guys sat when you guys sat down to write this? Um, <laughs> we just laugh for, for, you know, <laughs> yeah. for, but, I mean, for it's two, true. three weeks solid. Yeah, but we also were, were very critical of the, you know, the structure and everything. You know, it's... Um, Take away the comedy, you have to have the structure has to really work. And you can't, you know, in a movie, you're making a movie, it costs a lot of money to make a movie. And you really need to have a really tight script to be able to tell the story, you know. And then in addition to that is the comedy. Obviously, that's a whole other thing. It's like you can't just meander through like the humor has to be really tight. Or otherwise, it doesn't. It doesn't really work. I don't know how you feel, David, but I, I sort of like it fast because they, if you get the humor right, it really keep, they built each joke builds on the next joke in a way. You know? Yeah. So we, we wrote that thing in like I came over for two weeks to your place and basically we sat in a dark room and got most of it out. And we, as I said, you know, we just spent the entire time laughing, which is good. I guess, you know, if you, if it's funny for you, you kind of hope it's funny for everyone else. But anyway, after that, there was a quite a long process of rewriting and finessing and, you know, building on a few things that we didn't think were strong enough. And, you know, you championed a lot of that. Um, and doing research because you wanted the very similitude. Yeah, we went to the we went to the various coffee places. There's a place called Jones Coffee Roasters here in Pasadena. Um, and the guy who runs it, Chuck Jones, was a uh, involved with the World Barista Championship and stuff. So we wanted to understand, you know, how it really worked. We could ask him questions. You you kind of want to make sure that everything you're doing makes sense. And then, when, and then when we heard it for the first time with actors, it's just so rewarding because you're like, we spent all this time, he and I would do like the male voices, the female voices, the character voices back and forth to each other. And then when you actually hear somebody do it, it just takes it to this whole other level, which is amazing. It's a great process. It was really so much fun to do. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's great. So Coffee Wars recently premiered in London and being yes. as the film takes place primarily in London. It jumps around and features a throng of British thespians. It, it uh, must have been quite the party over there. It was really fun for us. We had A lot of them hadn't seen the movie and it wasn't like a, a, a full-blown premiere. It was like a cast and crew kind of screening for them and their families and reps and stuff. And it was just really fun to have the experience with them because what's interesting about it, because there's a lot of British, obviously British actors with British accents. You know, there's like Searsha's Irish with a sort of a thick Irish accent and a wine had sort of a Welsh accent. And to hear them responding to the jokes differently, that was really great. And then just sort of be in the room with them and hear them respond to it and, and what parts they liked. And that was really great. Did you get good laughs in the bright places? Yes. <laughs> we did. We rather get good laughs. Yes, yes, definitely. You know, the funny thing is, is that you you never know. You know, with actors, you never know if you know you're picking takes, you're picking performances, and I think they all were really, really loved the movie. So that was great. Yeah, and they really liked each other's performances, which was great. They were yeah. they they're a really good bunch of people. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, I want to hang out with these characters. I know. <laughs> that's a testament to the writing and then everybody that you put in there. Here's something that's pretty singular. I don't know that I've ever heard of a, I've never heard of a film donating its profits anywhere other than executives' pockets. But 100% of this film's yeah. profits will be donated. And I'm quoting the producer, charitable organizations that are working to ensure the health and sustainability of the planet. Yeah. So, it's not just the profits. It's the budget of the movie. And the profits. And the profits. 
Our investor, the group of people, they um, are behind many of the big vegan companies. They're they're invested in many big uh, vegan uh, companies such and as and almost every vegan charity. Yeah, I mean they are really committed to saving this planet right. and to saving the animals and to saving the humans. And uh, when we were talking about the release, we were we were always talking about a portion of the funds going to charity. And we were trying to figure out how to do that. And right on the call, it was recently the head of the group. He said, um, no, I want to do 100 percent. And we were like, wait, what? And he said, yes, 100 percent. The whole thing, 100 percent. We were like, but how's that going to work? I'm telling you, 100 percent. So that's so what, what's happening. Yeah, whatever money goes back to the investor gets given to various vegan charities. Yeah. And you know, he's really committed to it. So it's fantastic. That's great. That's wonderful. Yeah. No, and, and this, yes, it's never been done before. And You're correct. This is, and this is. And then there's the first... cow that got rescued at the end. Oh yes, we rescued the cow. All the animals in the movie we we bought and are part of the. You know, it's important. Even the civet. The, cat, the civet cat is. We they have a bigger uh, pen for the civet cat. We had a big donation made to the. It's a sanctuary, like a sanctuary where the thing is. Daisy the cow though was released from servitude and lives a happy free life now. Yeah, running with <laughs> running with horses. They're in the end of the thing. You see, the cow was running with the horses. I mean. Probably thought he was a horse. Oh, she looked so happy. It's pretty sweet. It was pretty sweet. I want you to know I will never drink so much as a thimble full of the milk they extract from you. Fist bump. Is that the way you think she should be remembered? It's not good enough to eat. Meet Joel Hanson. Good morning. This is her plant-based coffee shop. Coffee place and you don't serve regular milk milk. People like you demanding cow's milk. Pure straight up cruelty to animals. Did you know that? She's not really having a good day. Did I mention that Joe is extremely broke? You have to make a payment now or you're done. Do you think I can get an advance against my paycheck? Maybe we should stick to hearts and fans. But why don't you compete again? Otherwise the dream is free. What for Rudy? Two-time United Kingdom Bristol champion. So how's it? vegan operation working out i guess for those of us that are still on the wrong side of the coffee war what are some vegan substitutions that we should ask for when we go to get coffee well i mean there there's so many and it's really about your own taste i mean oat milk i think is the closest it has a thick well, we like oat milk. Yeah, we like oat milk, but there's all kinds. There's pea milk. Yeah, is Ripple big. is a pea milk, pretty which good. is pretty good. Yeah, I mean, all the stuff is at Whole Foods. There's like all the different varieties, but well, a lot of them. Can you are... get macadamia milk? I've never we, tried that. I've never tried it, but you can get it here. It's not common, but some people like coconut milk, almond milk, mm. definitely soy. Cashew milk, soy. Yeah. And in the movie, we, we were really careful not to be too... It was important to us not to be like proselytizing, like you have to do this. So we were really having a lot of fun with the fact that Bernie often says things like, you know, he's got his full fat cream and she's got her nut juice, you know? <laughs> like everybody is putting down what she's doing, which is, you know, makes it even harder for your lead character, which was really important. But I feel like... Even since we've done the movie, the world's shifting more where like you go to some little place and they have oat milk or they have varieties of milk, you know, which is fantastic. So, And even vegan cheese has come a long way because vegan cheese can be really bad, but it can be really good in the hands of a master vegan cheese maker. You know, like vegan ricotta is really good. That's where the, the deal breaks for my wife because she is a big fan of cheese. Well... The vegan investor group, they are pretty realistic. I mean, they, they, of course, want everybody to go vegan, but they're also realistic in that they're very much behind this thing called Veganuary. Veganuary is a is a group that believes you could just try to be vegan for a little bit. Like for January, just be vegan. Take a half a step, you know, like once a week, don't eat meat or twice a week, don't eat meat. Like all those little things, If you if you think about the world, it really changes the problem of the world because we have nine, we're going to have 9 billion people or something in the world. If everybody like just took a percent of that away, of the, the meat production and the, and the consuming of meat, it really makes a change across the world. And I would tell your wife, she should try just one Thursday evening, instead of using cream, soak cashews. If you soak cashews, they become, and then you use them instead of cream, they become a cream in your cream sauce. 
it's really amazing. I mean, they're actually really good. So there's all these things that you you learn and you try and it becomes easier and easier because there's more and more shortcuts. I mean, it's, more and it's more chemistry, difficult. you know, it's basically chemistry and it's how do you figure out the chemistry correct. I mean, one thing that he's really invested in, which is really amazing. So Just Eggs just got FDA approval to grow, basically grow chicken and meat in, I don't know how to describe this, in these gigantic vats in the U.S. And those are, that's going to be sold. So it's going to be actual meat, but it's not coming from chickens. And it's going to be grown meat that's then pressed into patties or whatever it is, breast meat or whatever. It sounds new world-ish. It sounds like the soil and green shit happening. Yeah, yeah it, doesn't, it doesn't sound particularly appetizing. Yes, but if you think about it, it's actually kind of interesting in that it is actually meat. I think that, like, for some vegans, they don't even eat the faux meat, like vegan meat that you can buy. Like, we had a couple people on our set that were raw vegans. Not cooked. Yeah, not well, cooked not, anything. Not cook everything. You know, there's like a raw vegan movement. And then there's, you know, there's a lot of vegans that won't eat processed faux meat, which is really made out of wheat or other things. So there's like different levels of veganism and sort of different levels of religiosity about your veganism. But, you know, any way that we can reduce our carbon footprint. Even if it's well. even if it's like what Veganuary stands for, you know, it's kind of a cool idea to just sort of try to shift a little bit. You don't have to go all the way, but you shift a little bit. Yeah. I did notice when we had that astronomical rise in the price of eggs, that just eggs were sold out in every grocery store I went to because they suddenly became more economical and people were willing to try them. And I think they're made with mung bean, but they're really good. Isn't that crazy that the, the vegan alternative was cheaper than the... <laughs> And that brings up a, another point, you know, you hear a lot of people say, you know, what change can you possibly make when in the United States, we as a developed nation do so much for the environment. And that's it's all these other countries that are the ones. And if they don't follow suit, then what's the point? What would you proffer to someone? Uh, well, I don't know if that's really true. That's a sort of a America first point of view, because I found like in the UK and London, there's much more vegan coffee shops and vegan places and uh, Serbia where we shot the bulk of this movie had an amazing vegan cuisine like lots of vegan restaurants so you know in Australia and in I know Australia this, yeah and other parts of the world so I think that's like this America first point of view thing that you know we we use that as our defense or whatever you call it to say that you know well everybody else is doing it so why should we I don't know. I don't know. I think you have to lead by example in the world. You have to try to do things. If you're able to do something, do something. Don't say I can't do it because no one else is doing it. I mean, that's like that's like kind of a cop out. <laughs> I would agree. You mentioned that you tried not to, you know, be too preachy. Not only is the film not preachy, but I think, especially if I were to show this to, you know, my parents or friends of my parents, <laughs> I think there would be some like, oh, look at these weirdos. Because you do, they are lovable weirdos, but they are all of them eccentric. So you kind of also poke fun at, at that stereotype of, you know, vegans may be eccentric people sometimes, but they're people and they're, they're sweet. I don't know. You did a nice Nice job of breaking that down a little. The coffee extremism yeah. is is in there too. You know, it's yeah. not just the vegan thing. They're extreme vegans, but they're also extreme, you know, coffeeisters. True. You know what? Every single human is eccentric. Yes. Some people just try to hide it, but you know, there's no normal. So yeah, but I, I agree with what you said because it's like intentionally she has green hair, which is like almost a stereotype of being like you're vegan, you have green hair. But it's because she's also very into coffee and all this other stuff. So you're like, okay, so she's got green hair, but she also has all this ethics and all this other stuff about her, which we, you know, you look at her on the on the face value, you look at her and you think, oh my gosh, she's just some crazy person with green hair. But then you start to realize, well, she's a person just like everybody else. She has desires and hopes and dreams like everybody else. And she's faltering in her goal, you know, and she has to try and do something. So I think that's also really good is if you can figure out a way to take the sort of unlikely person that may not be the person that you think they are and then give them a heroic journey. You know, that's what I like in a movie. 
It worked. I mean, I was I was on board with her. It's the passion in her opening sequence. She's absolutely disgusted <laughs> by, yeah. by this by this woman's ignorance. And then it's nice that you put the little button on the end where she comes back. A Another really good... amazing actress, by the way. That's Lydia West. She's Lydia. phenomenal. Mm. And uh, Just a Sin was on an HBO miniseries. <laughs> Last year and a half, she's had a real sort of meteoric rise. She's a great actress. Is there anything that we did not get to that you would like to talk about? As we said, the movie was shot in, in, in London and Serbia and Colombia, South America. We took a lot of care with the coffee people that were on set. We had like a, a world champion on set, Nenad, his name was. I'm not saying I'm bastardizing his name. I'm sorry. But he was the Serbian champ who became the world champ. And then there was another European champ. So we wanted to make sure that Joe was really at that level. And all the actors got trained so that they didn't look bad at doing what they do. But, you know, I mean, that, that's what you have to do to have some authenticity. My personal favorite scene in the movie is the, the fight club scene. The idea that uh, they have these, like, coffee throwdowns, that was really my most fun moment. I don't know about you, David. The, the froth-off, where they're, yes. you know, doing yeah. the different... Yeah, that's great. And it gets more and more and more extreme. They have, like, you know, uh, crazier and crazier drinks that they're making, and they take it very seriously... And Rudy is just out of his mind in that scene. It's really funny. That was the scene where I'm like, this guy's terrific. I looked him up and I was like, Florence Pugh's brother. Yes. Oh, that's true. A lot of talent in that family, apparently. Yeah, a lot of talent. And he's a great singer, too. He's a singer-songwriter, too. He's like touring right now. Yes, he's touring, right. You made me think of the credit sequence. I love it when movies do like some kind of artistic interpretation of each character when you show their names in the credits. And that was a uh, layup and it was so well done. Oh, I mean, all their pictures in the locket. All, of the, yeah. Yeah, all yeah. of the foam are pictures of these. Of What's the really interesting is that because, okay, so the movie's come out now. It's on, you know, it's on Amazon and it's on iTunes and Google Play and stuff. And a lot of these coffee influencers, there's lots of people who are really into coffee in the world, right? But all these coffee influencers are now doing either the drinks from the movie or they're doing latte art of characters in the movie. So if you go like on Instagram, you see like Kate's face and, and Rudy's face and the different characters' faces. People are doing the latte art, which is really cool. It's kind of fun for us. And they're also doing the drinks. They're going, well, is this a really drink? And they're doing the drinks and you see them on Instagram and stuff. That's also really cool when life sort of when the art imitates life and then vice versa, which happened on Bottle Shock, we did that movie. And then like after that movie was done, tour buses were going to Chateau Montalena to see where we made the movie. <laughs> right. And in this one, it's like people are going to see what these drinks are and trying to find these drinks and figure out these drinks. And I'm just waiting for people to go try and find La Finca Dos Marias, which is an actual coffee plantation and get that coffee. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I love coffee. The question isn't, whether or not I drink coffee, but how many cups a day. Reading this, several moments of laughing out loud. It's an animal secretion just like cow's milk. Hold on a sec, girlfriend. Milk is an edible secretion, isn't it? Like, come. Part of the humor, the person who's receiving a line reacts. But I wouldn't know. This is poo, and poo is an edible. Letting it breathe or cutting it tight. Say, is that a swan? Varies from moment to moment. Or a Western screech owl. <laughs> the antagonist Rudy and our protagonist Joe are all very passionate about coffee. Stop your Ethiopian with almond milk. Wow, good memory. Well, I am a professional. Rudy is a bastard. He's kind of a bad guy you love to hate. And two time United Kingdom Bristol champion. So. England is hardly the United Kingdom, and you lost at Worlds. Well, there's always this year. I did not start drinking coffee until I was about 25 years old. Began working the long hours that an editor works. Became a necessity that slowly rolled into an addiction, then into a love, maybe a passion. So, wines. The story of a nightclub. Coffee. Now what? What are you going to teach us about next? <laughs> Well, we're Jody and I are working on a movie called Super Crip, which we're trying to put together. It's actually starring the character Tobias Forrest, plays the lead of it. It's basically we're dealing with the problem of disability in Hollywood. As it turns out, I mean, basically 26% of the population in the U.S. has some form of disability. I'm sure it's the same all over the world. And less than 1% of the characters portrayed in movies have a disability. And of those, 95% are cast with people who have no disability, right? 
And invariably, people who win Academy Awards, oftentimes, you know, it's like my left foot or like Forrest Gump, you know, they like take the guy's legs off or they fakes like he's a disabled person. It just doesn't seem like that's right. And so we've concocted a, it's a funny movie, but it has a lot of serious undertones to it. About, Sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, it's, un, it's very much an underdog. He's very much an underdog. And yeah, to Toby is a quadriplegic. Yeah, so that's uh, that's what we're hoping to do next. But we also, David and I and, and Jody have talked about doing sequels to Coffee Wars because it would be really fun to take them to other countries. You know, like they're competing in Korea, they're competing in Australia, they're competing other places because there are lots of very funny, very specific characters in the coffee world. Like people who really care about it in their world, you know, in Iceland, they care about it a certain way. And in, in Memphis, there's there's a group of coffee makers that really care about it a certain way. Our daughter was in Cambodia and met the Cambodian barista champion, which was pretty exciting. Yeah. So, you know, one storyline we had talked about was like Rudy's character. He's decided that he's a vegan. He's faking of being a vegan and he's being more vegan than she is. So there's there's lots of possibilities. But is he okay. really vegan? Or I, we haven't like, decided that. I haven't talked to you about yeah. it. We're this out right now. Right, we're talking about. We're making it up. <laughs> but I'm just saying, people don't realize that. That I guess if you're in the coffee world, you realize it's very worldwide. But people don't realize in America how big coffee is all over the world. And it would be really great to sort of go into that. You know. You yeah. know, it's it's interesting because at the end of Bottle Shock, Alan Rickman has a line. He's talking about how the democratization of wine started at that moment in the Judgment of Paris. He said, and now the world will be open and they'll be making wines, you know, in Georgia and this place and that place. And China. It, it all came true. It, I mean, it wasn't true. true when he said those lines. But you know, that event and hopefully our little movie contributed to it. But, you know, it's it's interesting the power of film to spread a positive or negative message. But in our case, we try to stick to positive. Well, like Kate was saying, how Okja, the movie Okja was the reason she became vegan. It was a really lovely movie. And it had but but it was a story. It was just a story about this little girl and this pig that she loved. Right. And there's a lot more to it. But a little story about a, about a woman who is trying to compete in the World Breezy Championships, you know, it could change a bunch of people. People could decide, hey, let's give this a shot. Let's go vegan for like, you know, Monday through Friday or whatever they want to do. It can have impact. I'm ready to make that change for my health, for the planet. And uh, great movie. Well done. It's my favorite film you guys have made yet. Hopefully that coffee should be on its way. You haven't, have you, <laughs> have you received any no, more odd dog yet? No, but I really do like the odd dog. And David, I'm going to, I'm going to have to, next time I see you, I'll, I'll send you some of the odd dog coffee. It's really good. I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. Oh, so, <laughs> so they have a company called odd dog coffee, which is a coffee company. And uh, they sent in, us in Ohio, in Ohio. And they sent us right. some of the coffee and it's really good. It has like little bits of, I can't describe it, but it has, what it has cardamom. They're really original. A little coffee. bit of chocolate, a little bit of spice to it little pepper to it they're really interesting well they mix that in the in in with the beans in the beans yeah oh, that's just the top notes of the coffee no there's one there's one that's got um cayenne cacao and cinnamon <laughs> that one's my favorite but then yeah he does have a cardamom and clove one which is really strong really that'd strong. be like indian so that'd feel like india wouldn't it something like yeah. that he yeah. used to do the the mushroom one the rishi shroom i don't think he carries that one anymore but i haven't been home in so long he's like wait till you get back and you see he's like it's not just this anymore he has forayed into making these like you know mixology coffee drinks he's explaining it to me and i'm like jesus dude i'm gonna have to make all those <laughs> he's like it's well, you'll be fine we're coming the next time we go to cleveland yeah oh, that would be that would be such a treat to meet everybody we're definitely going to try to do sequels if we can and and definitely we'll be drinking that coffee we drink right. a lot of coffee trust me, <laughs> me too. that's actually interesting i mean i've never heard of that kind of coffee infused with other flavors yeah that's that's sort well, of novel, he, does it, he uses natural stuff too you know he's he's on about you know companies that when they want to do flavored beans they just spray it down with stuff and he's like nah so he um he takes it very seriously he's a one of those kids that um I say kid, we're both like 40, but he can't stop moving. He's got to constantly be doing something. Yeah, he puts he puts his his ass into that company and it shows. 
We sounds like the the sort of fanatic that we really need to, you know, kind of throw some yeah. sunlight on. Exactly. <laughs> now exactly. he has one truck. Uh, he does, and he he does it on the on the weekends. So he and his and his wife and their child they run it on the weekend, and I'll be I'll be running it Monday through Friday. Wow, that's great. Yeah, it'll be fun. Who yeah. knows? Maybe I'll never go back to teaching. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds good. Soon you'll have 12 trucks and then we'll make a movie about you. Oh, that would be badass. Don't tease. Um, <laughs> I'll make you one on the house. All right. This has been great. And it was said already, but Coffee Wars, the new film from uh, Randy and Jody and David, you can find it on Amazon. You can rent it or you can buy it. If you buy it, you can watch it anytime you want. And there's a little extra money that goes to those wonderful charities and organizations. It's also on Google Play and iTunes. So check it out. Like I said, it's just, it's like a nice little caffeinated underdog story. And it's very sweet. It'll make you feel nice. No edges on this. Well, there's some fun. There's yeah, some he fun. drinks. He drinks some of the beans himself. I'm not going to get into it, but yeah, you know, <laughs> there's a few things uh, that happen. Yes, I think David put it well. Where you know you could sit and watch this with your with your parents. They might squirm a little bit on a few scenes, but all in all, I think it'll be an enjoyable evening. Thank you very much, Jody. Thank you, David. Thank you, Randy, for letting me be a part of this. This was a lot of fun. Well, thank you for thank having you. me. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, thank you. For Spro and Lee Take on the Academy, I'm Lee, and we hope to see you sitting front row when the envelopes are red. The word for the championships was a cash prize of 50,000 euros in espresso. I chewed that nutter from nationals that went completely mental. What? This is a coffee competition, not a milk competition! That nut milk has turned her into a nutter. <laughs> We need a signature coffee drink. For our signature drink, the civet cat eats the coffee cherries, shits out the beans, and the enzymes create a distinctively pungent yet savory flavor. Did the cat eat a bunch of garlic chili paste? Uh, oh, that was me. These coffee beans got me. I'm from you. Uh -huh. I like it. <laughs> These cherries, they are the very best of the best. This is exactly what I need. Yeah! A coffee taste bud takedown. Oh! Lisa! All right, keep your hair on. The World Barista Championship is the Everest of coffee excellence. And there's only one way to scale it. Together. I'll put you out of business. Well, you better win this thing then. I am all in. I'll make you a believer. And 100% of the revenue is going to charity. Environmental causes save the animals, save the planet. And by the way, I'm still not Morgan Freeman. It's our fault if the world ends in 12 years, so we should try to not have the world end in 12 years and we have the opportunity to go to vegan. Hey girl, may I present Cameron and the other guy, I don't know his name. They're the only two dudes I could like get. I think it was like a year and a half ago. My brother started informing me of like the negative effects of specifically red meat. And I think that people are going to be really receptive to the movie because we ultimately, I think, respond more to things like movies, film, than we do to people just like telling us to be vegan. That's Angelo Moriando, the inventor of like the espresso machine. Joe believes he's like the patron saint of coffee or something, but I don't know. I'm having so many laughs during this film. It's great. And everyone's so passionate about the environment and, and about veganism, which is awesome.